Hello, Springford families. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm the principal at Oaks Elementary School. The purpose of this video is to provide you with more detailed information regarding topics that have been presented at recent school board meetings. We know that you have a very big decision in terms of whether or not to send your child back to school beginning November 12th or to remain virtual. I'm joined today by my six elementary principal colleagues who at this time will introduce themselves. Hello everyone, uh, Rob Moyer, Principal of Brook Elementary. Thanks for being with us today. Hello everyone, Jacqueline Havrilla, Principal at Emmons. Glad to see you today. Hello Spring Ford families, Lori Pignani, Principal at Limerick Elementary School. Hello Springford families, Teresa Carboy, Principal at Royersford Elementary. Hello, I'm, I'm Sue Choi, Principal at Spring City Elementary. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Patchkey, Principal at Upper Providence Elementary School. One of the first topics that we would like to review with you is masks. By this time, you should know that masks will be required at all times in our schools. This re requirement is not only for students, but it is for the entire staff. As a part of our day, we will be building in mask breaks so that students have an opportunity to remove their mask and get some fresh air. Our exceptions to wearing masks are primarily in the lunchroom where we can socially distance at six feet between students and a potential at recess to also remove a mask. However, we will need to exercise the six feet of social distance in order to do so. Something that is important to remember is that any student who refuses to wear a mask will be sent home. There are no exceptions to this statement. Also, if your child is in need of, an, of a mask, the school can provide one. Hand sanitizing um, stations are placed in each classroom and throughout the building so that at any one point, students are able to access hand sanitizing solution as well as the adults. In addition to that, all classrooms will have um, tubs of wipes, which are additional pieces to wipe down desks and any other materials that might be used in the classroom. Cleaning is nightly. They will be cleaning the classrooms with disinfectant. During the day, there will be someone cleaning high touch areas throughout the day, such as light switches, door handles, um, any of those areas that get touched all the time. Uh, lunchroom, cafeteria desks, or tables will be cleaned between lunches and disinfected each evening. And classroom desks are cleaned and disinfected each evening be and between sessions for kindergarten. But additionally, with the uh, wipes in the classrooms, it also gives the teachers an opportunity to clean desks um, throughout the day if, if that is um, something that they choose to do. Classroom setup, as you can see, we have the students' chairs and desks in the classroom, which will be separated to the maximum extent possible within each room. Students will have assigned seats um, because they'll be in with the same cohort of students. We want to make sure that we have um, the tracking for the contact tracing. Movement will be minimized in the classroom to maintain the maximum distance between students. In addition, our specialists will be moving to the classrooms to minimize that movement around the building. Um, so instruction in those areas will be uh, conducted in the classroom as much as possible. And finally, we would have a limit on shared materials in order to maintain safe classroom expectations. Okay, let's talk about class size. So the district is committed to trying to keep our class sizes both in person and virtual. Um, also, we know that through second period, the family choice matter is going to allow the options of cyber or virtual. So obviously um, there could be some seats in our classrooms that aren't filled, but at the same time, 
we're prepared for 24 if that's what needs to happen. Now buses, uh, it, is, it is important to note that buses will be transporting stu students at a maximum of three students per seat. We don't know exactly yet how many of our parents will be transporting themselves. So it's important to keep that in mind because um, although students, we may be prepared for three to a seat, some of our parents will be transporting, which will lower the number of students on the bus. But keep in mind, no matter what, masks are required on our school district transportation. In hallways, also, it's we're doing our best job to try to limit tr uh, transition in the school. In saying that, we're going to do um, the best that we can to stagger travel and not have a significant amount of students in the hallways at one time. Also, we're going to try to keep directional flow, keep children to the right side of the hallway as much as possible. And again, uh, please note that masks will be required when children are moving in the hallways. All right, let's talk about lunch. One of the areas um, that we've already identified that students uh, may be able to take off their masks is in the lunchroom. So what each building has done is established um, seating uh, that puts students at a six foot distance from each other so that they uh, are permitted to take off their masks and eat their lunch. Students will be provided an assigned seat at lunch. And while they're at that assigned seat, they will be able to remove their masks um, in order to eat. Um, we will make attempts in the lunchroom to limit the amount of travel. Anytime a student does get up from their, their seat during lunch, they will need to put their mask back on. So we will look to minimize travel by hopefully being able to bring some items to them, uh, a napkin or a straw or something along those lines. And our lunches at this point will be grab and go lunches um, if you choose to purchase a lunch. Recess is another area where we're hoping our students can get a little bit of a relief from their mask. Um, our classes uh, for recess will be cohorted together. So uh, in a grade level, each class will have a designated area um, on the playground that they will be able to participate in recess together as a class. Uh, we will not be intermingling classes during recess um, as, as we're going to continue to cohort. Uh, we're going to try to encourage our students to move around as long as they are moving around and keeping a safe six foot distance. They will be able to remove their masks while they're participating in recess. Um, however, we will ask students that if they are clustered together or participating in an activity that does not allow them to be six foot apart from a peer, we will ask them to put their masks on during that activity. Students will be able to use the playground equipment um, as long as they're moving about. Uh, and we are also looking at adding some additional recess time uh, into the uh, school day for classes so that there's an additional opportunity to take those mass breaks. Now, while our fingers are crossed that we'll always be able to get our students outside for recess, sometimes Mother Nature does not agree or cooperate in that regard. In those cases, we will have indoor recess. Um, indoor recess will be in the classroom uh, where students will be at their assigned seats and just the the makeup of those rooms and those assigned seats and the need for physical distance, the need for mask wearing in the classroom will significantly limit the activities that students will be able to do during indoor recess. Another thing of note is uh, we are asking that students do not bring any type of playground equipment with them to school, a ball, a glove, um, and uh, any type of toy. Uh, we'll, we're asking you to leave those at home even if it is a day where there might be some indoor recess, that includes personal technology as well. well. Arrival and dismissal will be very building specific since each school has a unique layout. Most schools will have some changes in their arrival and dismissal plans due to an anticipated increase in drop-offs and pickups. Many buildings will be establishing a PM car pickup line which would require a, some staggered dismissal times. I would say in the next two weeks, you should be hearing from your specific building principal in regards to updated procedures. Last less, I know that as parents, we are faced with making a difficult decision regarding the reopening of schools on November 12th. 
Surveys were sent out to all families on September 30th, giving US parents three options, in-person learning, cyber, or virtual. Although we will do our very best to minimize any change, your response and the survey results will be the driving force in helping us make decisions as we formulate class lists with any needed changes. Please know and understand while making your decision that some of our existing teachers across the district will become virtual teachers. The virtual students may have a teacher from Royersford Elementary or a teacher from another school. Virtual students may have students from other schools in their virtual only class. Selecting the model virtual or in person based on teacher is not a guarantee of staying in a teacher's class. Teacher designation will not be de determined until after survey, the survey closes and the data can actually be analyzed. As far as commitment, keep in mind that what you decide will be your commitment for the entirety of the second marking period and that your response will help us make those informed decisions. We do understand that all family situations are unique and in an effort to accommodate all the needs, we ask that you please, please respond no later than October 8th, which is this Thursday. We need every family to respond and have input so that we can all be prepared. Parents, you can change your designation through October 8th. Please respond and make a decision that is appropriate for your family. No matter what you decide, please find comfort in knowing that we will continue to work together to make this a positive experience for your child. We do appreciate your efforts and support as we all continue to move forward and keep all students and staff safe. Just in closing, thank you for joining us. Hopefully the information that was shared today will give you some additional information to help you make the ultimate informed decision with what will be best for your child. If you have any questions, please check out the Spring Ford website for additional information. There is a reopening tab where you can find um, more specific details with presentations and plans that were submitted to the Pennsylvania Department of Education. And if you have specific building questions, please reach out to the building, whether that's the building principal or the classroom teacher or even a, an office secretary. We are here to help you. We understand that this is a very, very big decision that you have to make, and we will do our best to help you navigate through the pros and cons. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. <laughs> So as part of the COVID-19 task force, the nurses have had meetings with Michelle Masters, who we all met today. Thank you, Michelle. Um, she's encouraged our assignment of a few COVID liaisons in our district who streamline the reopening process of positive COVID cases in our school. The Springford liaisons report directly to Michelle or to one of the two other directors for guidance with each individual case. While the, role, the roles of the Spring Ford COVID liaisons differ from those from the Department of Health, like we heard from Michelle today, the two collaborate together to best prevent the spread of infections through our schools. We currently have three COVID liaisons at Spring Ford. Nurse Erin Lewandowski at the elementary level, Nurse Jacqueline Gospoderek at the secondary level, and Athletic Director Mickey McDaniels for our after hours notifications. The system they have developed has proven to be efficient thus far and they will continue to evolve the process as needed. So what happens when somebody gets ill at school? Once a nurse is notified of an ill student at school, she will meet the student in a triage area to assess for symptoms of COVID-19. The Department of Health has provided all school nurses with an algorithm, which is shown on the screen, to assist in determining whether or not the student should be excluded from school. This algorithm will be used in addition to the current standing orders from our district physicians. If a student or staff member presents with two of the top system, um, symptoms under the first bullet or one of the bottom symptoms under the second bullet, 
the Springford nurse will comply with their recommendations to separate the ill person from the general population. Each building has a designated area for the care of a symptomatic person, which we have termed the health annex. This area will separate ill persons from any high-risk students or staff members in the building until the ill person can be taken home. Students going home from the health annex will be brought out to their parents through a designated exit door. We will request that parents not enter the building for pickup. So when can a student who gets sent home return? In order to return after being sent home through the health annex, which means that you are exhibiting symptoms of COVID, one of three scenarios must, must occur. First, the ill person tests negative for a COVID test. Once the test is negative, if that person has improved symptoms and has no fever, you'll notice the term a febrile on the slide. That means without a fever. So improved symptoms, no fever for the past 24 hours without fever reducing medicine and has tested negative, that person is ready to end quarantine and can return to school. The second scenario, if the ill person does not take the COVID test or tests positive, the person must isolate at home for 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Once that isolation period is over and the symptoms have improved and there's no fever for 24 hours with no fever reducing medicine, that person is ready to end quarantine and can return to school. The third scenario is a little different. The ill person has a documented medical condition with an individualized health plan that the physician determines is the cause of the excluding symptom. This is called a differential diagnosis, which is listed up there. For instance, if a student with asthma presents with cough and difficulty breathing, the nurse will complete an assessment and follow the student's individual health plan for treatment, which may include the use of an emergency inhaler. If the student improves after treatment and does not exhibit any other COVID-related symptoms, this student can remain at school. He has a documented differential diagnosis of asthma that explains his symptoms and the treatment plan has worked. If the same student does not improve after the use of his emergency inhaler, he may be sent home for his asthma, perhaps to use his nebulizer at home. If symptoms improve, this student can return to school the next day because again, he is not exhibiting signs of COVID he has a documented differential diagnosis that caused his symptoms. However, if this very same student presents with a cough, difficulty breathing, and a fever, the student would be sent to the health annex and required to follow the guidelines seen here for quarantine. The reason is that fever is not a typical symptom of asthma, so the differential diagnosis does not apply. It's important to realize that a cold is not a differential diagnosis nor is a stomach bug. A differential diagnosis must be documented as a health condition in the student's health record in order to be used as a return to school option. Now there may be a situation where a student has an illness that requires being sent home, but is not necessarily indicative of COVID-19. For instance, a student presents with a fever greater than 100.4. The student has no other symptoms on the COVID list, we will send the student home ill based on our doctor's orders, but not as a COVID quarantine. Fever was one of those symptoms that requires two or more to quarantine for COVID. So provided that no other symptoms evolve, this student is allowed to return to school once he's fever free for 24 hours without fever reducing medicine. As you can see, there's many factors to consider with each person that presents ill at school. In each instance, the school nurse will use her assessment skills, she'll use the medical background and health history of the ill person, and the COVID guidelines for exclusion to determine how to best exclude from and return to school. So what happens when someone is diagnosed with COVID? Typically, a person will not be in school when they test positive because quarantine is required while waiting for test results. So when we hear that a person is COVID positive, our Springford COVID liaisons need to collect certain information to provide to the local health department. 
The purpose of this is to determine what is called the incubation period or the infectious period of the positive case, which Michelle did talk to a little bit today. The incubation period is the time between exposure to an infection and the first appearance of symptoms. We know that with COVID-19, a person in this pre-symptomatic period can still spread the infection to others. So calculating the probable days of being infectious will help us determine if anyone else at Springford was potentially exposed. Meanwhile, the positive case must now isolate at home, but the end date for her isolation is dependent upon whether or not she has symptoms. And I do have the right slide up. Good, I wanted to make sure. As you can see on this slide, a person with symptoms and a positive test result can return 10 days after the start of symptoms, as long as fever and the symptoms have resolved. The test date in this case does not matter as, as far as the end of isolation date is. Again, the presence of symptoms tells us that this person is probably already two to five days into the incubation period once the test was collected. So they're already working their way through the infectious stage of their virus. On the other hand, a positive case with no symptoms must wait a full 10 days after the PCR test is collected due to the fact that we are unable to assume how far along that person is in his ability to spread the virus to others. A positive case in our district will be contacted by the nurse or the Springford COVID liaison and by the local health department. We will work together to help with the isolation rules. So no one needs to figure this out by themselves. What happens to a close contact? First of all, a close contact is anyone who was within six feet of an infected person for more than 15 minutes with or without a mask. Because of the incubation period and the possibility that COVID was being spread prior to us even knowing that anyone was sick, we must include any contact that occurred up to 48 hours prior to the positive person's symptoms. This is the reason that it's so important for us to have seating charts whenever possible and to remain in cohorts at school. The Springford COVID liaison must work with the local health department to identify which students spent time within six feet of the positive case in every classroom, on the bus, and in any Springford related extracurricular activities, anywhere that we cannot maintain physical distancing. Since in this plan, Springford is not able to guarantee social distancing, there will be significant numbers of close contacts for each positive case. These close contacts must be quarantined for 14 days. This quarantine period begins on the last date of exposure to the COVID positive individual. At this time, the Pennsylvania Department of Health recommends that all close contacts take a COVID test during their quarantine, but it's important to realize that a negative COVID test will not shorten the quarantine time for a close contact. Again, due to that incubation period of the virus, and since we know that the close contact was indeed exposed to the virus, we must allow the full 14 days to ensure that he doesn't become positive and then spread the virus further in our schools. Because of the complexity of contact tracing and the ease with which COVID is able to spread, we urge all students and staff members to stay home if you're not feeling well. If you remain home with new symptoms of an illness and improve on your own, you can return to school. But if you come into a building with symptoms of COVID and the school nurse has to send you out, one, you're potentially risking the health and safety of others in the building, and two, you're now required to quarantine until you have met one of those guidelines set by the Department of Health. So who gets notified at Springford of a positive COVID case? A member of the Springford COVID Task Force will work directly with anyone who tests positive and anyone who must quarantine as a close contact. The local health department will also be in touch, as we said, for assistance with contact tracing. 
In compliance with confidentiality and privacy rights based on HIPAA and FERPA, a person's private health information will not be discussed with anyone else. Unless you are notified to be a close contact of a positive case, please do not ask your building nurse, your principal, or any member of the COVID task force for the personal health information of anyone else. However, the Springford Area School District does have a plan in place to keep the public notified of the level of COVID-19 spread in our community. Springford will share COVID-related information and educational resources each Monday with an updated level of community transmission for both Montgomery and Chester counties, the number of confirmed cases in our school, and the total number of confirmed cases in the Springford footprint. Families should not expect to receive school-specific information unless they have direct contact with a confirmed case. In this sample, we see that the Spring Forge School District 7-day update includes an overview of the entire number of cases in the school district and not at a specific building level. Individuals identified as being in direct contact with somebody will be directed to quarantine. Information will be sent to these families directly from the COVID task force. 